my name is Robert Duncan, and it's a nasty wet night, even though it's very warm, <laughs> unseasonably warm in New York City. Um, so um, first I wanna welcome everyone to uh, this evening's event. Uh, I call these talks Art Talk, um, and they're, they range, the topics range everywhere from uh, discussions of individual artists uh, to uh, like tonight, a topic that's much broader that embraces a lot of different art. Um, this is actually the second part of a two part presentation that I call Faces from the African Diaspora. So what I'm trying to do here is um, show works of art that most people are probably not very familiar with. Um, part one covered a vast amount of time from ancient Egypt all the way up to the 19th century. Um, and there'll be one little overlap in today's program because one of the artists in the first half, Henry Ozawa Tanner, um, was born in the 19th century and he lived into the 20th century. So I'm gonna be showing another work of his uh, that I didn't show in part one. Um, but before I go into this, uh, I just want to say that I give a little plug. Uh, right now in the gallery of the Hudson Park Library is an exhibition that I helped organize. Um, it's called the, the Portrait Project, and it's a group of 11 artists. I'm just going to read their names. Um, I'm one of them, uh, so I'm not going to read my name, but Leonard, Leonard Gervitz, Valerie Gillette, Howard Gladstone, who founded the Portrait Project, Karen Kapke, Sharon Moreau, Dina Schutzer, Donna Skibo, Jenny Tango, who's here with me tonight in person, Clarissa Payne Uvegi, and Yu Zhang. Um, it's a group of 11 artists who get together, and basically the idea was to pose for each other and paint each other or draw each other. And the work that's on display is not necessarily work of the artists in the group, some of them are, but they're all portraits and um, they present a kind of interesting and diverse uh, cross-section of contemporary portraiture, um, which is what I'm gonna be dealing with in this discussion of faces from the African diaspora. So all of these images you're gonna be seeing are for the most part portraits of specific individuals and the cover image that you're seeing on your screen now um, presents two images that you're gonna see again. Uh, the sculpture is by Elizabeth Nancy Prophet and the painting is by Cedric Huckabee, um, who's a young contemporary artist. And then of course, there's a map of the world from the point of view of Africa as its center. Um, and as the name of this presentation uh, kind of says, most of what we're gonna be seeing is work done representing people from uh, whose ancestry is from Africa. Uh, and that, that sort of embraces everybody because we're all ultimately descended from Africa, but specifically, um, you know, since I would say, uh, you know, the ancient civilizations like Egypt um, and, um, going up to today, we're going to be looking at 20th century and 21st century art. So with that introduction, we'll move ahead. Um, I don't actually have images from the very first decade of the 20th century. So the images really start around the period of World War I. And these are two works by German artists, Hermann Struck and Thomas Baumgartner that were done during World War I. Um, specifically, Thomas Baumgartner um, did a whole series of soldiers, portraits of soldiers from different parts of the world. And of course, in 1916, a lot of Africa was colonized by European countries. And so there were um, African men in the service serving the various countries um, that had colonized their countries. Uh, French, you know, soldiers from French Africa. Uh, there were soldiers, I believe, serving in the German army as well. 
uh, from colonial German Africa and so forth. So he really did these paintings as an investigation into the various um, ethnic groups that were involved in uh, combat and the war. And these are two crewmen soldiers. Now, I'm not exactly sure where crewmen are from in Africa, um, but uh, like I said, he did works, uh, portraits of men from Asia, from different parts of Africa. And um, it's a very interesting series. Unfortunately, later on in Thomas Baumgartner's life, his work evolved away from this more somewhat expressionistic painterly style to a more hard, more nationalistic style. And I say unfortunately because he was featured very prominently in the House of German Art, which was a gallery endorsed by Adolf Hitler. So his work became very nationalistic. And of course, with the Nazi idea of the Aryan race and the Ubermensch, the superiority of the white Aryan, um, which of course Hitler didn't look anything like himself, but ironically, um, the kind of work that Baumgartner did uh, from the 30s on was much more in line with Nazi ideology. Hermann Struck, on the other hand, was a Jewish German artist. Um, he was based in Berlin and he was mostly influential as a teacher of etching, uh, a graphic technique. He published a book, I think in 1908, uh, about the uh, kind of technical manual on the art of etching. And he was uh, an instructor to many of the prominent German artists around his era, the late 19th and early 20th century, people like Lovis Corinth and Ludwig Meidner, who I've spoken about in a previous session, um, Max Lieberman, um, you know, many of these German artists studied etching with Hermann Struck. Um, however, being that he was a Jew and also a very active Zionist himself, um, he was instrumental in a movement uh, of a, a kind of religious and um, nationalistic movement of Zionism. Uh, he moved to Palestine, uh, I believe in the 1920s, and he was one of the founders of the Bezalel School of Art, which was the first art school opened in the state of Israel, um, which actually was created before Israel became a state in 1948. So there, I found that there are different titles for this small painting. Um, and to me, it doesn't look like an Arab at all. It looks like a North African, um, but um, I mean, there are Arabs in North Africa, but he's wearing a hat that's actually a fez, which is a Turkish style hat. And uh, another title I found for this is Young Man in a Turban, and this is not a turban. So <laughs> I preferred to use the, the title uh, Young Arab. Um, so this is a work by a Swiss artist, Felix Vallotton. Um, he was Swiss uh, from Lausanne, which was the French speaking part of Switzerland. But very early in his life, he moved to Paris and he became very active in a group that was known as the Nabi, uh, which was a group that included people like um, Pierre Bonnard and um, uh, uh, now I'm forgetting his name. Uh, another very famous artist, his name begins with a V, but I'm not coming up with his, his name. Uh, anyway, it was a group of artists who got together that sort of followed ideas coming from Gauguin uh, and uh, they named themselves Nabis, which means the prophets. And they were very involved with um, using decorative uh, patterning, um, sort of flat, they were very influenced by Japanese prints, which were all the rage at the end of the 19th and early 20th century in uh, Europe. Um, and, um, Bellaton was the only foreign non-Frenchman working in this group. Uh, oh, the, the name of the other artist I was trying to think was Viard, Edward Viard, um, wonderful painter. Uh, anyway, so Felix Bellaton 
uh, was involved with the Nabi group. But as his work developed, um, he really moved in a more individual direction. His work got more realistic, uh, less flat, uh, less decorative. And he did uh, uh, around this time in the 1910s and teens, he did a series of paintings of women, portraits of women, in particular, a number of paintings of African women, uh, probably models that he found in Paris, um, from, possibly from the Caribbean um, and also from Africa. And I believe this young woman, uh, we don't know who she was specifically, but if you look carefully, you'll notice there's like a kind of scarification on one side of her face. Um, actually, you can just see it very vaguely on the darker side of her face as well. So there's symmetrical markings, which are, are probably um, markings from the original group of people, the ethnic group that she comes from in Africa. Um, they're very kind of stark and simple and very direct. And I particularly like this painting because I think, for one thing, it's a very beautiful young woman, but also she seems to have this kind of um, interior expression on her face. Um, and although I think Balaton was a very gifted portrait painter, he didn't always uh, practice a sort of psychological realism that I feel is in this painting. So I mentioned in my introduction that there's one artist I'm going to be looking at again uh, that was in the first half of my presentation. In the first half of my presentation, I showed a painting by Henry Ozawa Tanner of his mother, which he did when he was back in the United States visiting um, because he settled in Paris and he stayed there. He married uh, an American woman, but she was a white woman. They had a son together. And um, his teacher, uh, Thomas Akins, with whom he studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of Art, um, is the person who really urged Tanner to move to Paris where Aikens had studied, um, study there and then pretty much stay there because he had a more promising prospect as an African-American uh, artist in France than he would in America. And he did in fact suffer at the hands of some of his classmates when he was a student at the Pennsylvania Academy. Um, they did some pretty outrageous pranks on him that were you know, really because of his race. Um, and this particular painting, I'm sure many people will recognize the subject. It's a portrait of Booker T. Washington. And I never knew what the T in his, his middle name stood for. And I was kind of interested to discover that it's Tagliaferro, which is Italian, which means cut iron. Um, so that's kind of a strong name to have. Booker cut iron Washington. Um, anyway, of course, Booker, Wash Booker T. Washington was a very important, perhaps the most prominent African-American in America during his lifetime um, as an educator and as a kind of advocate for um, Black people in America. However, you'll notice the dates that Booker T. Washington had already passed away in 1915, and the painting was done in 1917. So obviously, Tanner worked from photographs in order to create this painting. And um, it's interesting to note that the painting is in the collection of the State Historical Society of Iowa in Des Moines, of all places. And there is a story behind that, but I don't really, I didn't unfortunately have a chance to really investigate that. Um, but it's an interesting um, place for this painting to be. What? I, I just noticed that now the port the question mark. Yeah. I don't know why it's there. It's, it's I didn't put it there. It's there all by itself. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so people who are watching disregard that little question mark by the title because uh, I don't know where that even came from. Uh, you know, technology has a way way of doing things without us completely in control. Uh, anyway, so these are two portraits of uh, aging women. I had actually presented both of these images earlier when I did another two-part presentation about images of aging women. Um, so the one on the left is by Archibald Motley, 
Um, and it's actually one of two portraits he did of his grandmother, Emily Sim, Sims Motley. Um, he did the second one a little, one a little bit after this one. So this was the first. Um, he was very, Motley felt very connected to his grandmother who had been born into slavery, but uh, was freed as a young girl. Uh, and I think that, you know, this is a very moving image, particularly looking at the hands, his kind of thin, bony, long fingered hands that he features very prominently in the painting and her very direct gaze outward. Um, the other portrait is by Laura Waring Wheeler, um, and it's of a family friend, Anna Washington Deary, uh, painted a few years, five years after the Motley painting. Um, and um, this painting uh, and Laura Wheeling's wear, Waring Wheeler's work was uh, part of the Harmon Foundation uh, collection. And there's a few other works that you're gonna to see tonight that are from that collection originally. The Harmon Foundation closed in 1967. It was founded by um, an intellectual and um, uh, philanthropist, uh, African-American philanthropist who was very interested in promoting uh, African-American culture, music, musicians, composers, and visual artists. And they would have these yearly exhibitions of, uh, of paintings and sculpture in different museums and around the country. So the bulk of the Harmon Foundation collection went to the Smithsonian Museum of American Art in Washington, but some of it also was distributed in other national museums. So you will recognize this image again from the first, very first image uh, that was introducing this uh, topic. Uh, this is a portrait by Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. Um, uh, she was the first African-American female student to graduate from the Rhode Island School of Design. And this sculpture, which you're seeing in two different views because it is sculpture and really should be seen in the round, um, is one of many works that she did in wood in direct carving in wood. And she was particularly uh, known for her work in direct carving. So you could see that she left the tree trunk pretty much intact as a base and then carved back and into it, um, leaving chisel marks on the top of the base and also signing her name on the base. And then, you know, very meticulously carving back into the wood to create this really very impressive and powerful head. Um, and like a lot of the artists from the 1920s, uh, uh, particularly African-American artists, uh, these artists were responding to Alain Locke's uh, ideas of the new Negro and um, the idea that um, African-American artists have to present dignified images of black people because there aren't many it, that were created by white artists, although you know some were made. Um, and it's very significant that, you know, also women were so active in what became known as the Harlem Renaissance, even though the Harlem Renaissance was not just located in Harlem, there was sort of a corresponding movement, uh, which was generally called the New Negro Movement um, in many big cities in um, Philadelphia and Boston and Chicago. Um, so this work by Elizabeth Nancy uh, sorry, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet um, was eventually acquired by her alma mater, um, which has a museum um, in Providence, Rhode Island, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum. Excuse yeah. Would you like to read uh, place Yeah. Which, which would we see? Is, is the, these are both the same sculpture. It's just that the the lighting on the paler image uh -huh. is different. Uh -huh. And that's why I put them together because actually the one that's on the right is more accurate to right. the color of the piece. Right. Um, but because it's three dimensional, 
I wanted to give you some sense of what it's like to look at it from two different perspectives, but it's the same piece. And it, I believe it is when I've been to the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, it was on display. Uh -huh. So you should be able to see it if you ever go there. Okay, so another American artist uh, who, were, who went to Europe, uh, I should say Nancy Elizabeth Prophet also spent some time in Paris, um, but she didn't really have a lot of funds. So her time in Europe was limited and um, she came back and um, she, you know, she spent, I think she spent about a decade in France and traveling around Europe, but mostly she was based in somewhere around Paris. And that's similar to the artist whose work you see here. These are two self portraits by the same artist. And you can see there's a shift in his style that's very clear. And actually, I'm not showing you his last style, which is even very different from this. But his name is William H. Johnson. Um, he studied in New England with an artist named Charles Webster Hawthorne, uh, who had a very specific approach to painting using sort of small dabs of color based on observation. And I have to say that I studied with a sort of descendant of Charles Webster Hawthorne, um, a teacher who used a similar method. So I'm very familiar with this kind of um, color spot way of painting. And that's sort of what's seen in the earlier of the two self-portraits. Of course, it's more realistic. And also he's using, using a kind of almost Baroque lighting scheme where he's emerging from darkness, sort of like Rembrandt or Caravaggio, which I'm sure um, Johnson had in mind when he was doing this painting. Um, he knew art history very well. And then he went to uh, France and settled in Paris and also traveled around Paris. And he encountered the work of um, a Belarusian, Belarusian artist named um, Chaim Soutine. I don't know if they ever actually met, but they were in some of the same towns outside of France. They both painted in those places, except Soutine was there about 10 years earlier. But his style, Soutine's style, which was very expressionistic, involved a lot of very gestural brushwork and very strong distortions, uh, seems to have influenced uh, William Johnson's work a great deal um, in this period. And so the self-portrait from 1929 really reflects that influence. And I think it's interesting because Soutine uh, came from Eastern Europe from a very, very poor Jewish uh, family. And uh, like I said, I don't know if Johnson ever met him, but I feel that there must have been some identification with him being an African American, you know, and having uh, lived in America where he would have had very limited opportunities as a black man. Um, he actually met a Danish woman who was an, also an artist and they married and um, she died fairly young of cancer. Uh, and that sort of set him on a kind of very negative chain reaction. He, he had a, a nervous breakdown and he was institutionalized for the last 20 years of his life and stopped making art. But as I said, he did have another style that I'm not representing here, uh, which was very much influenced by Southern um, African-American folk culture and his work looks very folkloric. And that is the style that I think most people associate with William H. Johnson. So another artist who also spent time in Paris, um, this is like the destination also for a lot of jazz musicians, um, Louis, uh, Lois Milou Jones, um, uh, spent time in, in Paris. Uh, she went on a scholarship to Paris, uh, came back to the United States, ended up being a professor in a historically black university. She sort of founded the art department there. And um, she worked in a style for a while that much, very much reflected her experience in Paris uh, with like post-impressionism, 
these two paintings are close in time, so they reflect that particular style that was very influenced by her Parisian stay uh, using a kind of palette knife, very much influenced by Cezanne. Um, so these are two paintings, two portraits by her. One called Dans un Café à Paris, which is obviously in a cafe in Paris, but it's a portrait of an African-American um, actor, Lee Whipper, uh, who was in a film actually, and, and you know had a fairly successful career. Uh, but here he just looks like, you know, rather anonymous looking man uh, with two uh, small sandwiches and some wine um, seated in this Parisian cafe. The other painting is much more historic in that it really represents Lois Milou Jones' reaction to lynchings that were happening quite often in America. And this was painted when she did come back to the United States in 1944. So this is during World War II. And there's a kind of, kind of irony in that painting too, because she realized that, you know, the fascists in Europe were actively destroying the lives of many people, um, principally Jews, homosexuals, uh, gypsies, uh, you know, whole groups, ethnic groups that were being um, murdered, you know, in this genocidal campaign. And there were African-American troops serving in all of the armed forces of America. But when those soldiers came back home, they could suffer the same kind of bias, you know, and, you know, even kind of genocidal attitudes, um, especially in the South, not just limited to the South, but certainly in the South where lynchings were quite common, unfortunately. So this is a painting that she did. I think it uh, sort of parallels Billie Holiday's song, Strange Fruit, um, of an older uh, man who's looking up possibly at another victim of a lynching. We don't know what he's looking at, but his hands are bound with rope. And we know from the title, Mob Victim Meditation, that um, you know the artist was very much commenting on uh, this lynching situation in the United States. So this is a work by an artist who I've just really recently discovered uh, with this one watercolor painting. In fact, until yesterday, I didn't even know that this work was in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection. Um, and I don't usually put in my captions where the works came from, but in this case, I thought it was interesting. So Samuel Joseph Brown Jr. Uh, was particularly known for his watercolors. And um, if you search him online, if you should be so interested, you'll find another watercolor self-portrait of him where he looks very kind of elegant and dapper. Um, I really don't know much about his life story. I just know that he did a lot of work in watercolor. And he was a member of the Works Progress Administration, the WPA during the depression. Uh, it's a project that was established specifically, at least the art branch, to give work, salaried work to artists. And there were two, actually there were three divisions. One was the mural division, which many, many artists participated in and they created large scale public murals for post offices, hospitals, libraries, public buildings. The other was the easel division, which was the part that Samuel Joseph Brown Jr. was part of, where artists were basically free to make work uh, in their studios uh, for a set salary. And they were expected at the end of the year to produce a certain amount of work, which then would be distributed again to be part of permanent collections of art in public uh, places. And the work sort of accumulated so by the end of the WPA, because by 1943, we were in the war, the WPA still existed into the war period, but it sort of um, collapsed because of the need for funding for the war effort. Um, so the WPA uh, administration 
um, just distributed the collection to various museums. And this ended up in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection. It's generally not on view, especially since it's a work on paper and watercolors are very sensitive to exposure to light. So if you're interested in seeing this work, you'd have to make an appointment, which you can do uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in their works on paper division uh, to ask them to bring it out so that you can see it. So, you know, I'm talking about the night, right now we're in the 1920s, 1930s, and that of course is the era of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, actually, by the 1930s, the Renaissance was more or less history, um, but it had a tremendous impact in Black communities in urban areas, particularly here in New York City. And one artist who uh, originally came from the South but settled in New York City was Augusta Savage. And Augusta Savage was a sculptor. Um, she also spent some time in Paris as a student. Um, I believe she, she tried, but I don't know if she actually succeeded uh, in studying with Auguste Rodin, but she certainly knew Rodin's work very well. And um, when she came back to the uh, United States and settled in Harlem in New York City, um, she was kind of a leading cultural influencer to use a kind of modern way of thinking. She opened a school of art that had free classes and attracted a lot of the next generation of African-American artists like Romar Bearden and um, uh, Thomas Lawrence, uh, Jake, sorry, Jacob Lawrence and, um, and another, uh, another artist, Gwendolyn Knight. Um, so this is a portrait of the young Gwendolyn Knight who was a student of Augusta Savage. Um, and then the painting next to it is by Gwendolyn Knight. And uh, she was born in Barbados, but her family moved to America uh, when she was still a young girl. And in Augusta Savage's uh, school, she met Jacob Lawrence, who became her husband. So this is her portrait done much later, um, but making him look very young in the painting, <laughs> I don't think really reflected what he looked like in 1986. But um, this is her very affectionate portrait of her husband, Jacob Lawrence. And they're both in the Seattle Art Museum because Gwendolyn Knight settled in Seattle and eventually uh, her estate donated this work to the museum. So another artist that's very well known, um, a white artist, uh, who's not particularly well known for portraiture is Georgia O'Keeffe. She was almost like a kind of a matriarch of uh, women artists from America in the 20th century. I think most people who are familiar with Georgia O'Keeffe think of her of flower paintings or of her paintings of skulls, you know, like cow skulls and ox skulls and images of New Mexico where she eventually settled. Um, but in New York, she met a young African-American artist, uh, Beaufort Delaney, and they became very good friends. She found him to be an utterly charming person and a very interesting, uh, uh, had a very interesting face. And she did, I think, five portraits of Beaufort Delaney. And these are just two of them. One of them is done in charcoal, the black and white one that's in the George O'Keeffe Museum now in Santa Fe. And the other one, which is this really beautiful pastel profile portrait of Beaufort Delaney, um, which is now in the National Portrait Gallery in, the, in Washington, DC. And uh, just to give you an idea of what Beaufort's work is like, this is his self-portrait done a year later uh, than, George O'Keeffe's portraits of him. Uh, this is an oil painting in the uh, Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, although Beaufort did study art formally, his style really evolved a lot. And in this phase of his style, he was very influenced by Expressionism, uh, German Expressionism, Fauvism, 
Um, and he did spend some time in Europe as well. And um, he kept sort of going back and forth between uh, these uh, figurative paintings. Um, he did several portraits of James Baldwin, uh, who I think he had a crush on. Uh, Delaney was gay and um, uh, very abstract paintings, these kind of gestural abstract paintings, but with a very kind of um, pastoral um, palette of colors, not, uh, not the kind of violence that you see in some of the abstract expressionist paintings. So I like to pre present artists who are little known uh, as I think you can tell already from the selection I, I presented. Uh, and I found this particular artist very interesting. I had shown this work before in another talk that I gave, which was entitled, What the Whitney Won't Show. And that was referring to the Whitney Museum of American Art here in New York City, and how despite the fact that they had a major portrait exhibition from their collection when they opened the new space uh, in the Meatpacking District, they had ignored some very significant works in their very own collection. And this was one of the paintings that they had decided not to include in that exhibition. And part of the point of my presentation was to think, you know, to speculate why did those curators at the Whitney choose not to show this work when they felt it very important to represent images of uh, black people and also works by black artists in the new building. Um, so even though Edmund Archer was a white artist, uh, this is a very powerful painting from 1940 of a young man, Howard Patterson of the Harlem Yankees, which was a segregated uh, basketball team. Uh, and such a powerful image of a black man, I would have thought would be really appropriate to that exhibition, uh, but this work was overlooked. And Edmund Archer was very interesting because he was uh, a, um, an early curator at the Whitney Museum. So he had a very key role in the formation of the Whitney. Uh, he was probably hired by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, who was the founder of the Whitney Museum. And he was particularly interested in the uh, culture of Harlem and did a number of paintings of uh, men and women living in Harlem. Um, so it's a kind of interesting painting that I thought deserved to be seen. So I'm showing you works by two artists who are almost exactly contemporary with each other. Andrew Wyeth, American artist who is very well known, born in 1917 and Charles White, born in 1918. Um, Wyeth's work is very interesting because, uh, I mean, he, he was somewhat controversial for various reasons. One being that, um, I don't remember exactly when, but back in, I think in the 1980s, um, Thomas Hoving, then director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art did a big retrospective exhibition of his work and many art critics found Wyeth's work to be very conservative, uh, very old fashioned, you know, out of step with the styles that dominated um, the art world at that time. Uh, his work is generally done in egg tempera, uh, very meticulously. If you could see this painting up close, you'd see all these fine little strokes because when you work in egg tempera, you really can't sort of just slather the paint on. It's not, it's, it's not a, a technique that lends itself to that. Um, so this is a very beautiful painting of a man named Willard Snowden, who was sort of an itinerant painter, uh, sorry, not itinerant, an itinerant individual who Wyeth found sort of um, just sleeping in, a, a, I think, a barn in his property. So he was kind of a, 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 what do you call people who just stay without paying rent? There's a word for it now. I can't remember what the word, there's a special word for that. But anyway, he was living there and wife befriended him and found him to be a very interesting person, very intelligent, um, you know, interesting um, 
person to keep company with. And like I said, did several portraits of him. Uh, apparently when uh, Willard Snowden had guests, he would like to offer them a glass of wine. So that may be one reason why this painting was entitled by Wyeth Grape Wine. Uh, it has a sort of somewhat grapey background color, but the other interesting thing is that the background, the, the back of the painting, the, the panel of masonite that Wyeth painted this on, he painted a kind of dark wine red. So that may be a kind of secret reason why he titled it Grape Wine. Uh, anyway, it's a very interesting portrait and uh, I want to mention that since it's in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection, um, when uh, a contemporary African-American artist is very celebrated named Kerry James Marshall, whose work you're going to see a little bit uh, later, uh, had a retrospective exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art a few years ago, he was invited by the museum to make a selection of works in the Met's collection that he felt an affinity with. And this was one of the paintings that was presented in that um, curated selection by Kerry James Marshall. The other piece is actually a monumental drawing um, by Charles White. And Charles White's work, again, was considered out of step for many years with the current um, art world, his work was very figurative, very monumental, um, very ambitious in the way he presented images of uh, Black people um, being an African-American artist himself. He wanted to make images of dignity and he also had a kind of political agenda. Uh, he was um, you know, kind of a left wing artist who wanted to celebrate labor and um, so this is a, a very, very uh, kind of representative work of a young worker uh, who's carrying lumber on his shoulder and sort of looking over his shoulder in profile into the light. There's a sort of romantic quality to it, but also a very grand quality. And White, like Wyeth, was a master of figurative draftsmanship. And I think you can see that very much in this uh, particular uh, example of his work. Excuse me. Yeah. Is oh, that's a good question. I didn't find that out. I think it's some kind of compressed charcoal. It's just kind of a, either it's a brand name or it's a particular process for creating it, but it's with charcoal, so it has to be compatible. So it would be probably some kind of black chalk, right. a processed black chalk. Yeah. Okay, so now we're in the 1970s, and I think this is a very 1970s looking painting in, in terms of the kind of clothing this guy is wearing. And clothing was very prominent in the work of this artist, Barclay Hendricks, who sadly passed away in 2017, rather young, uh, interesting artist. Um, he became uh, the main art faculty member in the University of Connecticut. Uh, for many years. Um, and his work is represented in a number of American art collections. I first saw his work in the Philadelphia Museum of Art many years ago when he was still a fairly young artist. He had an exhibition at the Harlem, um, the Studio Museum in Harlem when it was a fairly new institution. And um, he was very interested in representing people from the African-American community and also kind of types, even though they are always portraits of very specific individuals like this guy, Tyrone Smith. Um, he was very interested in the way they presented themselves in their gestures, in their clothing. Uh, he usually represented them against a very flat uh, colored background which also shows some influence from the minimalist movement, even though this is a very realist, hyper-realistic portrait and the figure looks very three-dimensional. The background in this sort of lavender pink color um, is very, very flat and uninflected. So he doesn't exist in a really uh, kind of deep space. It's almost like these photographs like Richard Avedon photographs where he used no seam paper, there's no 
background, just this kind of solid flat background. Um, and I know having spoken to Barclay Hendricks um, several years ago on the phone, that he was very involved with this kind of uh, flatness and three dimensionality, the, the three dimensionality of the sitter uh, or poser subject matter and the very flat background of his um, paintings. Yeah, it's some kind of. Yeah, and I think he actually did work in photographs. Yeah, they weren't. Uh, I don't think the ma the people who posed for him uh, sat for him, you know, for long periods of time in the studio. I think he took multiple photographs of them and then based his paintings on them. And sometimes he's actually been referred to as a photorealist, yeah. but his work has never been shown, or until recently, I should say, was not when photorealism came on the scene in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, he was usually not included in those exhibitions. Um, you know, I would say because of racism, but his work has recently been kind of revived and now there's a lot of interest in his work. It's sad that he's not alive to see that. Um, so this is a work by another artist uh, who had a big struggle, not because she was black, but because she was a woman, Alice Neal. And uh, finally, you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art last year gave her a major retrospective. And at the very end of her life, when she was in her 80s, the Whitney Museum had a big retrospective of his work. But that was not before there was a huge hue and outcry amongst feminist artists and also amongst figurative artists in New York City who picketed the Whitney and sent letters to the Whitney saying, you should open up and show more figurative art and you should start by showing Alice Neal, who is a very deserving, hardworking artist who kind of you know, spent most of her career in New York City painting her community. For many years, she lived in Spanish Harlem. And this woman, apparently, Carmen, was a Haitian housekeeper who Alice Neal knew. And um, she had several daughters. Uh, this daughter, Judy, unfortunately, was born severely uh, disabled and she died not very long after uh, Alice Neal painted this portrait, which I find uh, personally to be one of Alice Neal's most moving uh, and tender portraits. She could be pretty rough sometimes on her sitters, but this one really shows um, you know, her identity with this woman, Alice Neal, was a mother of four children. She had two daughters, uh, one that died of diphtheria, one that she was forced to abandon in Cuba uh, by her first husband, and then two sons with two different uh, men. Um, so she had young sons herself. And then, um, you know, when they were already grown by this time, uh, she did this painting of Carmen and Judy. And it's one of my favorite paintings by Alice Neal. Well, okay, the people on Zoom don't hear what you asked me, but uh, there's a person in the live audience. There's only three people in the live audience, I should say. And uh, asked me about the hands. Uh, I have to say that Alice Neal often um, paid attention to the hands in interesting ways. They're not represented maybe realistically, they're distorted. And I think in this case, um, she wanted to represent these kind of bony Venus hands of the woman who you know, is aged beyond her years from hard labor. And even the breast is kind of a flaccid breast. You know, you almost can't imagine that she could be breastfeeding this, this infant. Uh, so there's, there's that quality in Alice Neal. And I think that's a kind of honesty um, that she introduces distortions into her paintings that are very deliberate and are meant to express certain ideas about the people she's uh, representing. So if that answers your question, I'm sure other people out there might have had a similar question in mind. 
Um, so this is a work by uh, John Wilson. Um, again, this is an artist who was born in 1922 and died, you know, a few years ago in 2015. And of course, it's an iconic work in a way because it represents one of the great heroes of um, America, really, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, it's a drawing that he did in preparation for probably the most important commission John Wilson ever got, uh, which was a monumental bronze statue or head of Martin Luther King um, that was scheduled to be unveiled in a park named after Dr. Martin Luther King in Buffalo, New York. Um, so this is a drawing that he did where, you know, basically he did many drawings of King to really understand his facial structure and also how he was going to approach making a portrait of this kind of figure that by, by 1985 was this kind of uh, iconic figure in American history. Um, and this is the actual head that he created. So um, unfortunately, it's a detail of the entire structure. So it's on this kind of rough stone wall elevated at the apex of a kind of shallow triangle. Um, I, I've never been to this park in Buffalo. Um, so I can just imagine that it's probably at a gateway or an entryway to the park. But the thing that was interesting about this work was that there was a, a, a very influential member of the African-American community in Buffalo who objected to this likeness. He felt that the bust wasn't a good likeness of King and sadly started a petition to have it removed and destroyed. Now, I'm glad to say that this actually didn't happen as far as I know, the bust is still there. And I think it's a really beautiful and very dignified work of art. And personally, I think it's also a very good, uh, somewhat idealized image of King. But you have to remember that King was only 37 when he was assassinated. He was still a very young man. And this is a representation of a very pensive young man. In a way, I think Wilson wanted to universalize the image of King not make it too specific, not be too detailed. And in its quality of meditation and the solidity of the head, which is a sort of big kind of almost spherical shape, um, I think he succeeds very much in doing that. And to my mind, it's a very appropriate monument to the memory of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but like I said, there were objections to it, and um, there was a call to have it removed and replaced by a work that was more conventional, and that was a more, let's say, uh, detailed likeness of Martin Luther King. And I feel that that does not always represent a good public monument, you know, when you're trying to um, represent not only the appearance of a historic figure, but also the ideas, the philosophy of the person. So I think Wilson succeeded very well in doing that in this, this bust. Anyway, now we're back in Europe, in London, um, painting by uh, a very respected uh, figurative painter, Lucian Freud, who is the grandson of the great father of psychotherapy, uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, this was a very late work done in 2003 of a young woman. Um, I don't know how Freud met her. Usually he met people through social networks, through family and friends. And uh, he was doing a lot of what he called naked portraits from the eighties on into the very end of his life in 2011. Um, and uh, this is a really wonderful example. I apologize for the watermark from the Lucian Freud archive that's in this photograph. It's the only image I could find that really represented the work adequately. Uh, he also did an etching of the same woman. And if you're not familiar with this term solicitor, 
that's a British term for a kind of lawyer. Uh, so she's a lawyer, but obviously you can't tell that because she's naked in this painting. And Freud really enjoyed painting naked men and women and thought of them as portraits, in fact, more revealing portraits because they were naked. So they're sort of stripped of all their, you know, outer accoutrements, you know, if this was a solicitor, you know, in, in, in a London courtroom, she'd be wearing certain robes and probably a wig um, that solicitors are still required to wear in uh, trials in, in England. So um, these are two portraits by um, American artist Ellen Eagle, who works primarily in pastel. And this is a very sensitive portrait of a young woman with braided hair, um, very small. A lot of Ellen's work is very intimate in scale, often quite small and very meticulously executed. Um, Ellen has taught over the years at the Art Students League here in New York, and she's also published a book on uh, pastel painting, a, a technical book, uh, and her work is represented by the Forum Gallery um, here in New York City. And the other artist whose work I'm showing here is um, younger artist, Natalie Frank, whose work is really quite remarkable. Um, her work now, more recent work is more fantastical and sort of influenced by surrealism. Um, but, you know, in the earlier years of her career, she's still quite young, um, she was doing more realistic portraits and but there's always this kind of turmoil in her work both in the background and in the painting of flesh and I think um, she's somewhat influenced by Lucian Freud and also somewhat by um, Francis Bacon another British figurative artist whose work is much more distorted than Freud's is um, you can connect her also with an, a more re, um, recent artists like Jenny Saville, who's also a British painter. Um, but Natalie Frank works in New York. Um, she's actually born in uh, Austin, Texas. And uh, I think it's very interesting that in this portrait, I don't know who Dorian was, but she's holding a snapshot of what looks like a little boy. Um, and somehow that makes me think of the famous case in the South where there's now a, a, a movie made about it. Um, of course, uh, again, I'm forgetting the name of the, the victim of um, murder that took place in the 50s of a young um, African-American boy. My, my listeners are gonna know this and I'm embarrassed, I can't remember his name, but anyway, he was... Um, yeah, Emmett Till, thank you. Okay, yes. someone here remembered. Emmett Till, this, somehow I have an association and this is just a personal thing. I'm not saying it's uh, what Natalie Frank intended, but it, it reminds me of the case of Emmett Till, who I was saying was like about 14 or 15 years old and was accused of flirting with a white woman in a store and was um, murdered by the woman's husband and I think her father or father-in-law or something like that really horribly. And Emmett Till's mother very bravely decided to have an open casket to show the way in which this child was mutilated by these murderers who by the way, got off or not, you know, were acquitted even though they boasted of murdering this boy. And it's very likely that the boy who was visiting, I think from Chicago at the time, didn't even, I mean, he may have said a few words to the woman and she accused him of flirting with her. Um, anyway, um, I'm moving from a very tragic story to a kind of celebratory image here of um, Diane Edison who's an artist who sort of made her reputation on doing these monumental, larger than life-size portraits using an interesting technique. Uh, these are all done on black paper with either white or sometimes silver uh, crayon pencil. Uh, so they're very meticulously built up in little strokes 
uh, almost like, um, you know, Wyeth's uh, egg tempera technique, but using crayon pencil on these large sheets of paper. And this is a self-portrait uh, of Diane Edison from 2015. And then I have another example of her work. Um, this is a portrait of Sir Rodney, um, who is a gay activist and artist here in New York City, whom I met once actually. He was um, the last lover of um, Jeffrey Hendrix, who was the chairman of the art department at Rutgers University when I was a student there in the graduate program at Mason Gross. So I, I had an occasion to meet Sir Rodney and also speak, to speak to him on the phone. So I thought it was really a kind of coincidence that Diane Edison had done this portrait of him. And I mentioned earlier, uh, Kerry James Marshall, who is in some articles recently has been acclaimed the greatest living painter in America. And I certainly think he's a great painter, but I don't like those kind of superlatives. You know, I think there's many you know, quite a few really great artists work in America, but certainly Kerry James Marshall, who's based in Chicago, is up there um, and a, an amazing painter who's really for the last, um, I don't know, 30 years or so of his career, he's been documenting sort of everyday life of African Americans. Um, and I love this painting. I found it online. It's a, it's a fairly recent work. Laundry man, because there aren't really a lot of paintings of men doing laundry. Uh, historically, there are many, many images of women doing laundry, but you don't usually see men doing laundry. So I thought this is really a great image and it inspired me. And, and this is kind of a coming attraction because eventually I'd like to do a, a, a thematic presentation just about laundry and art. I did a presentation on sinks in art, so why not laundry? So this will come up again, but I think it's a great and very celebratory image of this guy like folding what looks like a dish towel in a laundromat. Um, and I really love it. Um, and this is a recent, a fairly recent self-portrait that Kerry James Marshall did um, and commissioned for a magazine cover. I don't remember what magazine it was, but um, generally speaking, uh, Marshall does not paint figures using naturalistic skin tones. Um, early in his career, he painted faces very, very black, just sort of matte black with features, but no, you know, like modeling, no articulation of bone structure. And as his work has evolved, it's gotten actually more naturalistic. But in this particular self-portrait, he felt obliged to paint his face in a more naturalistic style. So um, there is a large kind of tracts of color that define the bone structure and the skin, you know, and light and dark on his self-portrait, which he just sort of vaguely hints, hints at in the image of the laundry man where there's a little sort of lighter tones on his face, but he's kind of isolated. The head is isolated against the, a light area, which could be, you know, sunlight coming in from a window or it could be a window, but he doesn't really detail the architecture surrounding him as much as the, the, um, the dryers that are behind him and the things in the foreground, the basket of laundry, the detergent and the box, of, box I guess, of like fabric softener or whatever it is. So this is another uh, younger contemporary of Kerry James Marshall, Beverly McIver, who is a professor in, I think, Greenville, North Carolina. Um, anyway, her work is represented here in New York by Betty Cunningham Gallery. Um, but I thought it was interesting to show this uh, image of a postcard from a recent exhibition of her work, which is a, a, um, a kind of retrospective showing works from her youngest period, from 1983 to her most recent work. And that's sort of what's represented here, three sort of episodes. Uh, I think they're all self-portraits. The one in the middle, she did a whole series of her in blackface and clown faces and talking about 
you know, the history of minstrelsy and blackface in American culture. Um, and then the last image on this postcard, of the, the title of the exhibition was Passage, um, shows her, you know, an older woman, mature woman, she's actually younger than me, so I don't consider that old, um, you know, looking rather distraught in that painting, but a very, very powerful painting. And then the larger image, um, Praying Hands, that was done recently during the period of COVID when everybody was shut in. And I think Beverly McIver was very productive, as were a lot of artists, musicians, composers, writers, painters, during that period of COVID when we were more or less isolated. And I think this painting also reflects uh, her feeling about that period, uh, praying hands. And I just wanna mention that Beverly McIver lives um, with a, 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 I think it's a younger sister who is severely disabled, um, you know, like uh, developmentally disabled and she, she cares for her sister. So um, she also has done many, many portraits of her sister and family members and her work has a lot to do with, you know, family relationships and, you know, intimate relationships. And I find them to be very moving. Um, uh, sticking with this theme of family, this is a monumental painting. You can see from the dimensions 80 by 68 inches, very large, much larger than life-size head by a young painter, Patrick Earl Hammy, um, who I know somewhat, and I've been an admirer of his work for, oh, I'd say about 10 years now. And um, this is actually a portrait of his mother. Um, and uh, I curated an exhibition, I think two years ago, uh, which had to do with portraits of mothers and fathers. It was called Parent Portraits. And uh, Patrick was going to, I had actually selected this painting to be in that show here in New York City. The problem was shipping it, such a big painting, um, and there was no funds to pay for artist shipping. So the artist had to defray the cost of shipping. So rather than spend hundreds of dollars, what may have been thousands of dollars to ship this large painting to New York, uh, he made a new work for that show, a painting of both his father and mother together, very interesting painting. Um, but because I didn't get a chance to show this painting, I wanted to share it with the audience tonight. So it's a very moving painting of you know aging, an aging woman uh, and a very honest painting. And I think the eyes are really spectacular because when you look at them, you realize he's painted a whole landscape reflected in her eyes. And then also, you know, which is very much part of uh, Patrick's work, uh, he shows a kind of process of building and also dematerialization. So you see those drips at the bottom of the, um, you know, just at the, the base of the neck of the figure. And then part of her, one side of her face where he has not completely covered a kind of what looks like a black and white underpainting. Um, these works are done from photographs, uh, but they're so gestural and they're so interesting in the way he puts the paint down that they sort of defy the category of being photorealist paintings. Um, so again, these are works by younger artists that you can see from their dates that uh, Cedric Huckabee was born in 1975, so he's in his uh, early 40s now, and Jennifer Packer is almost a, a decade younger, born in 1984. Both of these artists were graduates of the Yale MFA program. Uh, and it's interesting that, you know, in the um, 50s and 60s, Yale was particularly known for Joseph Albers, who was an instructor there who came from the Bauhaus in Germany and advocated a kind of geometric abstraction. And as the Yale MFA program has evolved over time, more and more figurative artists got involved in the faculty 
And so consequently, a lot of really interesting figurative art has come out of Yale. And Cedric and Jennifer are two really wonderful examples of that. Um, Cedric comes from Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, he's actually a personal friend of mine. Uh, in fact, I spoke to him about this this afternoon on the phone because I couldn't uh, access any uh, information about this painting, which I actually, this is my photograph of it. I saw when I was visiting Cedric um, a few years ago um, in Fort Worth, Texas, and he took me to visit what had been his grandmother's house in a historically Black and Latino neighborhood in Fort Worth, Texas, which he um, has turned into this really wonderful community cultural center, which I think is called Kinfolk House. Um, it's a really amazing place. So he almost single-handedly restored the house, which the, the nucleus of the house is about 100 years old with additions um, that were added onto it over time. And uh, he took me to see the backyard garden, which he cleared out, which had all this junk in it. And now it's a beautiful garden with flowering trees. And um, part of the space he was using at that time, and perhaps still, I don't know, as a studio. So a lot of his work was lying around there when I visited. And I saw this very small painting, and I loved it so much that I took a photograph of it. And I thought, I'm going to show that as a representation of Cedric's work. Uh, generally though, Cedric works very large, uh, often these monumental portraits. When I was there, he created a chapel and it had portraits of uh, the matriarchs of his family, aunts and his grandmother who was known as Big Mama. And there are uh, enormous heads of these women uh, in a, a chapel space with pews and a kind of like a pulpit and everything. He'd gotten salvage pews and some salvage um, architectural details from what had been churches that were demolished. Uh, and it's really an amazing place. And his work fortunately is being uh, collected now by museums. And I saw a retrospective in Austin, Texas at the uh, Blanton Museum the University of Texas at Austin uh, of his work. Uh, and recently I was visiting uh, the Yale University Art Museum and I saw uh, a piece of his. Oftentimes when he does these small pieces, they're included in uh, installations that are like shelves, which have like family, like you do with your family photos. So they're, they're presented almost as if they're family photos. And sometimes he also, uh, mixes them with sculptures that he makes in a very interesting technique where he uses the dried up oil paint from his palette because he paints very thick and he builds up these like lumps of thick oil paint that dry and he creates an armature and then he slathers this dry, this dry oil paint onto an armature and then builds them up and creates these really quite amazing um, sculptures. So the piece, for example, that I saw in Yale was a little statue self-portrait um, in a kind of a cage-like structure with two oil paintings, one of his son and one of his wife, Leticia, who's a, also an artist and a photographer. Um, he has three children, a son and two daughters. Anyway, the other artist, Jennifer Packer, uh, has been very celebrated. Um, Last year, there was a major retrospective of her work at the Whitney Museum. This painting was not in that exhibition, uh, which is one of the reasons why I chose it. And also because it's just a painting I really love of hers, um, Ivan, it's a fairly early work. Um, and what's characteristic of it is the way she uses a kind of monochrome of very thinly applied um, oil paint in this case is kind of mauve color as a field, but very unlike Barclay Hendrix where the background is very flat, this is you know, very painterly and full of like manipulations of tone and so forth. But in certain areas like in the face and the hands and the one foot, um, she gets 
much more naturalistic and paints the skin tones and really uses a very interesting, very active brushwork to create the sense of the reality of that foot and those hands and the face, except for his nose. But oftentimes she'll let the background come through in the figure and she does this in kind of unexpected ways. Like, like I said, the nose here, which sort of jumps out because it's sort of left as a drawing with the color of the background coming through. Um, so this is a characteristic of her style and a very interesting aspect of her work. So I'm coming to the end of my presentation and uh, these are, uh, you know, I felt that even though my theme is the African diaspora, which is all about uh, African, you know, images of African, uh, uh, you know, pe people who uh, have their ancestry in Africa, um, so it's really not about African artists, but I had to make an exception here uh, with the work of uh, Amwako Boafo, who's a Ghanaian artist. Um, but I have to say that what's interesting about, uh, I mean, I think his work is very interesting and I'll tell you a little bit about his technique, um, but um, I was reading about his life and he's still a very young artist. He's the same age as Jennifer Packer they were both born in 1984. Um, he was mostly self-taught in Ghana, came from a very poor family, but luckily he was making a living for a while as a kind of a professional um, lawn tennis player. And um, I think his mother was a domestic and in the home of a fairly wealthy Ghanaian man who found out that he had artistic talent and he sort of gave him a stipend and this enabled Amoako to go to Europe and he stayed in Vienna for a while. Um, actually, I think he's married to an Austrian woman. And in Vienna, he was exposed to the work of Egon Schiele, who was an early 20th century Austrian expressionist painter. And Sheila's work really, I would say, is the main influence on Boaco, uh, uh, Boafo's uh, style. I, I hesitate to call him mature style because he's still quite a young artist. So he sort of, in the last few years, his work has hit the European and American art market and he's been very cleverly marketed and he has a kind of mind for marketing. So his work is now selling for astronomical sums of money and is almost like uncontrollable because of the secondary market. A lot of his work has been sold at auction for, you know, like half a million dollars and, you know, prices like that. Um, and it's had an impact on him because his, he now there's such a demand for his work and he has dealers in both England and America and all over the world and he's about to be shown in the Gagosian Gallery, which is probably the most, uh, you know, dominant gallery in the art market today. So it's had a kind of interesting effect that it, his work is very well known now, very celebrated, but, um, you know, the work is being sold at these astronomical prices. And even though they're sure they're gonna make him a rich man, they're not the prices that he was getting for many, many years. And uh, it's an interesting phenomenon, the way the art market just promotes and creates these almost like these megalithic artists. So uh, Boafo is already on that sort of road, um, well on that road, I should say. And, um, it, you know, the demand now for his work is huge and it's really affecting the way he's churning out these works. I'm not saying that he's making inferior work, but it, it, it can have that effect on an artist for whom there's such a, a, a demand. Um, what's interesting about his work is he started out as a fairly conventional um, figurative artist. He won an award in Ghana for the best portrait portraitist in this art school that he did attend in Ghana. I said earlier he was self-taught. He was self-taught, but then he did attend an art school in Ghana. Um, 
And then, uh, like I said, he went on to Europe and studied in Europe and, like I said, was influenced by Egan Schiele. And he decided to toss out his brushes completely. So the paintings are largely done with his fingers, especially in the flesh. And this is kind of, um, you know, churning movement of strokes of color. That's very typical of the way he paints the flesh passages in his paintings. And then these very clean areas, which sort of contrast with that, of the furnishings, of the background and the clothing that his figures usually wear. And they're often dressed in very chic, fashionable clothing. They verge a little bit, in, to my mind, on being a little kind of a fashion conscious. Um, and apparently he likes to show up at openings and art fairs wearing, you know, like really expensive designer clothing. Um, so the other work that I'm showing here was in an exhibition that I only recently found out about, unfortunately, I so I missed it. Uh, it was sort of just on the heel of the, oh, the beginnings of COVID 2018. Um, it was called Poto Prince which apparently is sort of like um, a Haitian um, dialect for Port-au-Prince, the main capital city of Haiti. Um, anybody who knows anything about Haiti knows that it's a very um, difficult country with a very difficult history, lots of violence. It was the first independent republic that was led by uh, uh, African people. Uh, in, in the Caribbean. Um, and um, I found a catalog of this exhibition um, at, uh, what's it, the big bookstore here in the neighborhood? Um, Strand. The Strand, thank you. It's the Strand Bookstore. And I thought it was really interesting. And I was particularly interested in this artwork, which I found in reviews of the exhibition, which were very favorable. Um, online, but I could not find the name of the artist anywhere. It was sort of like, well, the first room, um, you know, presented a bunch of stone sculpture and sculpture, but the artists were not named. Uh, and I found it very frustrating and also in a way very uh, incorrect. When writing reviews, the artist should always be named and some description should be given of their work. So if there's no photographs, you could at least say, okay, that well, that's the guy who made the stone heads. Um, and this artist, Jean Solomon Horace, who is known as T. Palin, Palin in Haiti, um, is a middle Asian artist born in 1961. And he specializes in these limestone sculptures. And I found one video interview in French about him. Um, is because he's speaking Haitian patois uh, and I'm not fluent in French, but I could sort of follow what he said. And he said, basically he was talking about how he came to be using this particular stone because um, he lives in a part of Haiti, which is near a river. I think in French, it means cold river. Yeah, rive foie, uh, foie. Uh, so, um, and, uh, or froid read, something like that. But anyway, it, it's, um, by that river, there are deposits of large limestone boulders, which he would collect and use to carve these heads. And I found these heads really interesting. Um, and apparently his father, you, to make a living, used to collect stones and sell them for gardens in Haiti. Uh, so there's a kind of a family history of an association with these stones. And I, I thought they were really very interesting sculptures. This is another artist, unfortunately, I don't know the name of the other artist whose work is behind uh, T. Pellen's sculptures, but I was particularly interested in, in showing these images. And um, this mural painting, I put here um, towards the end of my presentation because it sort of goes back to the first part of my talk, which represented artwork um, from, uh, like I said, ancient Egypt 
to the 19th century. And in that presentation, if you saw it, you may remember, there were a number of sculptures representing uh, St. Benedict the Moor. Um, so this is a modern mural of St. Benedict the Moor that uh, is in a neighborhood in um, Palermo, Italy, in Sicily, where there are a lot of recent emigres from Africa. And so he's sort of a patron saint of African Catholics, but also is a saint that's very celebrated in Palermo. Um, apparently he lived in Palermo and you know, became a monk. Uh, he was actually sold as a slave to a monastery and lived there. And he was so, such a devout Catholic and lived the life of Christ that he was um, sainted. Uh, and he's sort of like one of the patron saints of uh, Sicily. Um, so it's interesting to see this modern uh, representation of him in this neighborhood. And I like this particular photograph because it really shows uh, more or less in situ, you know, in this neighborhood with some old buildings and some apartment buildings and a group of three uh, African boys who might very well be recent emigres to Sicily uh, on this lawn. So obviously there's a kind of piazza, a plaza in front of it. Um, it's a very um, powerful image. This is my last image and a kind of interesting one. Um, so this work is by a Nigerian born artist and I'm gonna apologize in advance for my pronunciation. Njidike, Jideka Unkunyili Crosby. Um, she is also, you know, like this young generation of artists that I've been showing you like Jennifer Packer and um, the Ghanaian artist who, whose work uh, I showed you. Um, she's become very, very celebrated. Um, I think very deservedly so. Her work is very interesting. Um, she spent some time in London and is now living in Los Angeles in the US. I think she's married to an American guy um, and she has children. Um, but I thought what was really particularly interesting, this is a great example of her work. It's a very large, ambitious composition. Her work now is in a small exhibition at the Yale Center for British Art in um, New Haven. And I went to see it. It's a very beautiful exhibition of about seven pieces of hers, um, mostly focusing on portraits of children. Some of them are portraits of family members. And her work has a kind of intimacy and reality uh, and uh, uh, you know, very, um, beautiful, dignified representation of Africans and, you know, um, usually they're representations of people from Nigeria uh, using photographs, but she's a mixed media painter. So she works in a combination of acrylic paint, um, sometimes other tech, uh, materials and these kind of photo transfers, which she uses almost like decorative motifs. But when you look at them, you realize that they're dealing with the history of Nigeria and Africa and a lot of news events are represented on them. And she also loves to include details like um, stereo hi-fi uh, record players, which you see on the right-hand side of this painting, uh, flat screen TVs, you know, uh, family photographs, and so forth. So this is kind of combination of techniques that she brings together. And the reason I chose this particular piece, um, which remain thriving, which shows a kind of a convivial party of some, what looked like some friends or family members getting together in an apartment in, um, in London uh, with one little uh, boy there, a toddler. Um, is that this actually was commissioned by art on the underground for the Brixton tube station in South London. Um, so a Brixton, if you don't know that neighborhood is a historically black neighborhood in London. Um, and so it's a very appropriate thing to have this 
Nigerian artist who spent time in London uh, to make an image like this that one sees in a very public place. So you'll notice that attached to the painting or, or the multimedia work, I'm not sure exactly how this was, this was translated into a very durable material because it's out, you know, it's in a tube station, like a subway station here in New York. Um, but attached to the panels are three light fixtures. And um, so they're actually incorporated into the work. And I don't know what the tube station looks like. I think online there are some photographs of it in situ. I think there's a staircase that's right underneath this so that you sort of pass under it as you view it. Um, but I think it's a really great uh, example of successful commissioning of fine art in a public space. Um, so that's the conclusion of my formal presentation.